Good afternoon, folks. Uh, welcome to Olympus's Inspection 360 webinar this afternoon. We should have a really good talk ahead of us here, and I appreciate you all joining. I did want to just show you here briefly uh, how you can interact with us. There are several different ways. Uh, in the main portion of the screen here, you'll see our slides in just a minute when we're uh, when Dr. Gasly is presenting. There are also some resources over on the right-hand side uh, with additional information about Portable XRF and its applications in mining. Um, and then down below, if you click uh, in the middle, there's a section for attendee chat. We'll have a live chat going on. You can post your questions at any point uh, or discussion. Uh, I'm Michael Hall. I'm one of the x-ray specialists at Olympus, also product manager for the Americas. And I'm going to be monitoring the chat and sort of emceeing today's discussion. So feel free to um, open up that chat window and put discussion in. We're going to have lots of time at the end for question and answer, but feel free to just go ahead and put your questions in in real time as they, as they uh, come along. So I want to introduce uh, our, our speakers today. Uh, again, I'm one of the x-ray specialists. I'm Michael Hall, one of the x-ray specialists with uh, Olympus. Uh, joining me from Olympus is Todd Houlihan. He's our international mining director, uh, supporting our partnerships and collaborations with uh, the mining industry all around uh, the globe. So um, it doesn't matter where you're joining us from today, we've got a really strong technical team to, to help support you. And then headlining for us today is uh, Dr. Michael Gasly. He's a principal uh, consultant and principal geo uh, chemist for RSC. And he's going to share some about his history uh, and some current projects that he's working on, give us some uh, perspective on using portable XRF uh, for gold exploration and mining. So thanks again for joining us. I think you're going to find this worthwhile today. If you're new to uh, portable XRF, if you're not uh, familiar with X-ray fluorescence, we do have lots uh, of places in the mining life cycle. We're going to talk mostly about gold today, but for all types of uh, mining, copper, uh, base metals, platinum group metals, there's solutions throughout uh, the mining life cycle um, from from prospecting to exploration, processing, refining. So feel free to uh, see some of the resources on the right-hand side there in um, the webinar platform or to hit up our website to hear more about those things. But we're gonna focus my, primarily on, on gold today. Um, you can sort of think about portable, the evolution of portable X-ray fluorescence as sort of going parallel with the evolution of a lot of other uh, portable technologies. And I've used here the example of uh, what used to be called personal digital assistants or Palm Pilots was a brand name brand, um, and now more commonly, um, uh, you know, uh, smartphones like the iPhone or Samsung and that sort of thing. And so, you know, Olympus had at first you know, portable X-ray fluorescence instrument in the early 2000s, the Alpha, okay? This was, again, in what I would call the PDA or Palm Pilot era. And this technology has evolved over time uh, in much the same way, parallel to, you know, sort of improvement in processors and solid state memory that's happened for the, for the smartphone industry, getting us to where we are in sort of uh, fourth generation technology with the Olympus Vanta XRF today. Um, and there's been uh, developments in the processors, in the detectors from sort of low resolution silicon pin detectors to high count rate silicon drift detectors to sort of ultra high count rate or ultra low noise silicon drift detectors in the, in the latest generation. Again, parallel to the way we've seen an evolution in say uh, cameras on, on, on smartphones. And and parallel to the improvement in the hardware has been improvements to uh, the quality of the calibrations from sort of very rudimentary mathematical methods, Compton normalization, to very sophisticated uh, multi-beam fundamental parameters, first principles, chemist, uh, physics types calibrations, uh, what, what's sort of often referred to as mining or geochem calibrations in, in the marketplace. Um, so some of you have been uh, around for this ride of evolution from the beginning. Some of you may be joining very late. I want to uh, just for perspective, hand it over to my uh, colleague, Todd Houlihan. He's been here for much of this ride and can share some of the historical perspective uh, on this evolution. Todd. 
Thanks very much, Michael. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, good one. Welcome, everyone. Thanks very much for your attendance. So just a bit about my background briefly. I'm, I'm Australian. Uh, I live in the UK at the moment, but studied an applied science degree in environmental management at the University of Newcastle in Australia, and then spent the next seven years working as a contaminated land consultant. And that's where I first got uh, my first experience with portable XRF cleaning up a lead contaminated site in Sydney. And as a result, I went to work for a company called JBS, which was an environmental consulting company doing contaminated land investigations, but also had the distribution rights for the early night on portable XRX. And in that time, we gained a lot of experience using the equipment um, and developing methods to, to get good data. After that, I went to work directly for, for Niton in Europe, uh, looking out for Europe and Africa. Uh, and then they were taken out by Thermo in 2008. And at that point, I came over to Innovex, uh, which became Olympus. So I've been with uh, Olympus Innovex now for the last 13 years, looking after the global mining industry. So uh, that's 21 years now I've been working directly with Portable XRF in the, the, the minerals industry. And so before we, we start talking about how XRF got to the point where it is now in, in, in being used routinely in the gold market, I wanted to give a bit of background um, and point out that, that really in, when I first started working in this industry in, in the year 2000, it was from that contaminated land perspective. And, and even as early as the mid-90s, the United States Environment Protection Agency had written a method, uh, US EPA 6200, for using portable XRF for contaminated sites. And so that's one of the reasons why some of the early instruments had a soil mode, what we would call a soil mode, because the original modes on these instruments were designed for contaminated sites. Now, it's important to point out at that time, gold was about $300 an ounce, uh, a real low point. So there wasn't much happening in, in the gold market and detection limits were obviously rather high. But one of the landmark, um, landmark uh, points in, in the evolution of this technology was a large project done in Broken Hill. When, when the company Perilia took over the Broken Hill lead zinc deposit from Pasminko and needed to do a baseline soil survey of the entire town. And they chose Portable XRF to do that and they chose JBS, the company I was working for. And so the New South Wales Environment Protection Agency signed off on Portable XRF being used as the principal analytical tool to assess the contamination of the entire town based on uh, 100 years of mining uh, the, the line of load, which is right runs through the middle of the town. We also assessed 100 residential properties as part of that, um, lead in paint, lead in ceiling dust, lead in vacuum dust, lead in soil. And, and that was a real landmark moment in the evolution of the technology because it um, enabled a lot greater visibility into the mining industry on the capabilities of, of the equipment. And 10% was sent off for um, nitric acid digest at the lab and 10% and was sent off for hydrofluoric acid digest. And the results came back almost exactly the same. And, and so around that time, the 2002, 2003, we started publishing a lot of papers. Uh, we were doing a lot of work, but um, you know, the, the industry wasn't quite ready for such a radical, radical tool. Uh, no one thought a small little handheld instrument could do what we were saying it could do. So we, we started publishing a lot of papers at my Aussie Mine Geology Conference, at the International Geochemical Exploration Symposium. And it really started to gain traction because the, the science was so robust. And, and at that point, the, the early exploration adopters started to get involved 
based on those elements that we had proven in the contaminated land industry worked really well, namely lead, zinc, arsenic, nickel, copper, all elements that we were, we were proving were performing excellently. And so it was around that point that some of the more innovative junior explorers were coming on board, people like Ian Pringle, Alastair Cook, um, and uh, another landmark moment was the CSIRO in Australia, uh, Charles Butt, uh, Ravi Anand, some of the work that those guys did around 2003, 2004, who were gold, gold guys uh, and started to realise that, hey, OK, we might be able to use this copper, this arsenic, this uh, lead and zinc as a uh, pathfinder tool in the gold exploration business. And so it wasn't really, and, and so that took a lot of time to bubble up and give it some more credibility. And so it really wasn't, I think 2006 is quite an ambitious, um, when I tried to recall these, these, this timeline, it really wasn't until about 2008, 2007, 2008, when really the, the mid-tiers and the major mining companies like the, 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 the names you can see on the screen really started to adopt the technology, do their own evaluations on their own samples and compare the results with the laboratory. And, and so this is, this is my lead in to, to Michael. It, I think, Michael, this is about the time that, that you started to get involved in, in portable XRF. And, 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 and so I just wanted to give that background to, to, to where you, you come in, really, and your, your experience with the technology. So I'll hand over to you now, Michael. Thank, thank you, Todd. Um, yeah, I'll just, you know, we want to tee up here with, uh, for, for Dr. Gasly. I mean, he's um, going to been, as Todd said, sort of coming onto the scene in his own work in the, uh, the mid 2000s. Uh, all the, most of his schooling at Victoria University of Wellington and then uh, geologist at Barrick. So obviously a, a strong background in, in gold. Um, and then moved over to CSIRO the, in, in, for the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization. And, you know, strong research and publication record during that, that time um, tied to portable X-ray fluorescence, which I'll show in, in just a minute. Um, and then now is over at, at, at RSC. And so if you look at Dr. Gasly's publication record. This is just a selected bibliography, but what a couple of things stood out to me. Obviously, a lot of um, uh, work in, in gold mining, gold exploration, so uh, plenty of uh, deep experience with that. But, but also, if you look at some of his early publications, a lot of work on uh, establishing uh, the quality and reliability and best practices of portable XRF. And so you see some of his early papers here, a review of the reliability of portable X-ray fluorescence, or is there reliability and validity in portable X-ray um, fluorescence spectrometry? And what I noticed is over, over time, these questions about uh, the reliability or the trustworthiness or the value even of portable XRF, those questions have sort of faded away as we've moved, this has moved towards a more mainstream and accepted technology over the last, um, you know, decade and a half or so. So I'm very pleased to, to have Dr. Gasly with us today to talk a little bit about some of uh, the projects he's been involved on in the past, uh, his experience with uh, portable X-ray fluorescence and 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 some of the exciting opportunities he's involved with now. So, thank you, Dr. Gasly, for joining us, and I will look forward to what you have to share with us today. Cool. Well, hopefully, you can hear me. Yes, we can. Excellent. Go ahead. Well, look, excellent. Well, like look, like you said, you know, Michael and Todd, I started playing with portable XRF in about 2007. Um, you know, as your timeline kind of wrapped up there, Todd, segueing into what I'm going to, you know, talk about, you know, kind of here today. And, you know, back, I was at Barrack, as, as you noted, and I was given a portable XRF instrument and basically said, you know, go forth, make numbers, um, you know, do something cool with this, this thing. Uh, so I've probably made just about every mistake in the book and hope that I am 
not going to repeat those anytime soon. Yeah, you know, I want to share some of the those learnings and try and um, you know basically try, you know try and convince people that yeah, you know, portable XRF should, we should regard it as normalised. It's here, it works, and with a bit of a care, you can generate some really cool um, data that you can do a lot of cool things with. <clears throat> so with that in mind, I want to dive into the physics of portable XRF for a minute, or X-ray physics more broadly, actually, because we actually understand it really, really well, and there shouldn't be any surprises. Um, you know, all the things that we see, as I'll, I'll show some examples in a minute, we can model, we understand. So the way the X-rays interact with anything you put in front of an instrument, we have a pretty good idea how well that's going to work. I want to make some comments around the quality of your know, portable XRF data. I could plot, put plot after plot after plot of your know, lab portable XRF um, geochemistry data, but you know they all look very much the same. By and large, when the data are collected, you know, with decent protocols, decent workflows, and appropriate standards, and then you know the data are treated appropriately, you finish up with really nice um, comparisons to the lab. Um, yeah. You know, then, in the in moving into the gold space, I want to make some comments around you know the mineral exploration end. You know, what's a geochemical anomaly? How we might go about finding it? Um, how RF can you know play out what I think is a really critical role in that? You know, by generating really large data sets in locations, we're getting samples to the laboratory quickly, or or even at you know at a sensible cost could be difficult. Um, then I'll make some comments around portable XRF in the mine environment, and then finally some comments around gold by portable XRF because that's the thing everybody always wants to be uh, analysing directly. So the physics of XRF you know, are really well On the next slide, I have a table of you know, X-ray peaks, and we understand, we know what elements are there with which elements and thus you know, which problematic and which you might need to work harder on to to deconvolve, and I think that's something that comes back to the evolution of technology, you know, that Todd was alluding to earlier, and those algorithms getting better through time. That, you know, all of these interferences, these well-known physics problems, are being solved better and better and better as time goes forward. You know, you see like the cobalt um, deconvolution algorithm coming out, you know, from Olympus where we're getting cobalt, you know, probably traced a minor element that's got a peak interference with iron, so a major element. Like what we have here, here are some peaks that pile up. We've got sulfur, moly, and lead. Um, they all sit on top of each other. So you could imagine if this was the only bit of the spectra that you could see, the only bit that you were able to detect, you'd struggle to quantify how much moly, sulfur, or lead was in any given sample. <laughs> These things are known, you know, like I mentioned. Uh, I've got to use the click button to advance my slides. There we go. Um, you know, we have tables of of all the elemental interferences, all the different um, interfering on each other for the different um, elements. And you know, as I just had as my example um, there, come on, animation. There we go. You know, sulfur, moly, and lead are all listed there. And these, this peak at about 2.3 keV, killer electron volts, is um, where we have this interference happening. And you can work your way through the whole periodic table and find all the elements that interfere on each other. So there shouldn't really be any surprises when you say, you know, is the data for, I don't know, pick an element, you know, gold any good. You know, you can go and find gold on this table and you can go and find that arsenic and tungsten and zinc all interfere with it. So if you want to make a reliable um, you know, method to quantify um, gold, you'd need to be thinking about how you dealt with those elements. So like I say, shouldn't be any surprises there. You know, if we think about the um, the you know the physics of actually getting X rays, you know, from a an X ray tube to a sample and back to a detector, we can model that. We can model how far X-rays um, transmit in air. Here's some modeling that I did um, a few years ago where I was looking at uh, how many X-rays would get across once a one centimeter air gap. <clears throat> so basically, you have 0% you know, transmission at the bottom of the plot there and, uh, on the y-axis and 100% at the top. So Across this one centimetre gap, if the line's at the top, uh, all of the X-rays have made it um, across. And you know, along the X-axis, there is photon energy. So that basically relates to to the um, different elements. You can see I've labelled some there. So, you know, so 
just over 1 keV, magnesium a little higher, and calcium at 3.7 keV. And, you know, if you look at how many X-rays make it across that little air gap, for sodium, for one centimetre air gap, you only get 3% of those X-rays across. For magnesium, a few more, it's 9%. For calcium, it's about 88%. So this is telling us why we struggle with atomically light um, elements, because just the fundamental physics are problematic for us. Those The X-rays that, that are produced when you um, excite that sample with an X-ray beam uh, just don't uh, transmit very far through the air. So you know, you're going to need to be analyzing for much longer and thinking about um, other problems like um, what you've contained your sample in. So, oops, I probably just clicked twice and put two plots up, but that's all right. Um, oh, I'll go back one so we can see the key for the middle one here. So again, the same modeling I've done uh, on panel B there, but this time, instead of um, trying to transmit across one centimeter of air, I'm looking at how many X-rays make it through a given material. So the orange line is four micron mylar, and the blue line or the purpley blue line is four micron polypropylene. And we can see here that just by changing the nature of the material you cover the um, sample with, still four microns thick, but just going from polypropylene, which I think has a density of 0.9, to mylar, which has a density of, I think it's 1.4, um, you finish up with you know, 1.7 times more x-rays on the magnesium peak coming through. So when you're thinking about, you know, how am I going to analyze any, you know, my samples? What am I going to put them in? These kind of considerations really matter. And then you can take that forward in my final piece of modeling here, where I modeled um, what would happen if you analyze through 65 micron thick paper. So that's kind of like a typical you know, bag that you get your um, geochemical samples back from the laboratory um, in. And then I've also modeled um, 200 micron calico, kind of if you put your samples into a, um, yeah, say you're drilling an RC and you put your samples into a calico bag and you want to get some quick analyses and you just analyze straight through the paper bag, uh, sorry, the um, calico bag. And I've you know, present, shown here you know, calcium and iron. Um, we'll look at calcium for a moment. Um, you can see that um, the 200 micron thick calico for calcium, you're only getting 4% of the calcium x-rays through that um, calico bag. So basically, if you're going to analyze samples through a calico bag because you want some kind of quick you know, analysis of how much of you know, whatever element is that you're chasing that's in there, if your element's atomically lighter than calcium, you can forget it. All of those x-rays are going to be absorbed um, by the calico. Um, if you look at the 65 micron paper, about 32% of those x-rays get through. So you, you might be able to quantify calcium okay, but then you start to have problems that there's possibly calcium in the paper bag that you're analyzing through. Um, and you know these th this kind of provides us with a tool where we can decide where we are able to use portable XRF, you know, analyzing through these different sample media, what might be reliable or not. And it kind of goes to my point of, you know, um, there shouldn't be surprises. We can model this. You know, if you go and analyze, say, copper, you want to know copper grades and you analyze through a paper bag or you analyze through a calico bag, you're probably going to get some fairly okay results because copper is a little bit atomically heavier than iron, so its X-ray transmission is a little bit better. Um, so you should be getting, you know, 60, 70, 80, maybe even 90% of the copper X-rays through those materials. So you should be expecting to get low values, but they should be, um, you know, varying and reasonably well um, quantified compared to the values that are, you know, actually in the sample. I'm sorry, I mean varying is that you're actually going to see changes. Um, so... You know, there shouldn't be surprises here when we put different sample containers, I guess, between the sample and what we're analyzing. Um, we can do exactly the same thing with altitude. Basically, when you go to high altitudes, you get um, more effective um, X-ray transmission. There's less um, you know, oxygen and CO2 and um, nitrogen molecules to get in the way and slow down the X-rays, and we can model that on the left, I won't go into it in detail, 
But that means that actually, as the panel on the, the right shows, that uh, you can actually um, m uh, apply a correction factor to take that into account. And there's a couple of um, you know, data sets there, you know, two instruments that have a pressure correction built in and two that don't. And basically, um, the x-axis is showing what happens as you go to higher altitude. The far side of the plot's about 6,000 metres at 400 millibar. And I've just presented it as a normalised silica concentration, basically showing that if you start out at sea level, you have a value of one. If you go up to you know, four and a half, five thousand 5,000 metres, you're going to be getting one and a half times the counts of silica um, because there's less, um, the air's less dense. So, um, you're going to finish up getting higher silica values. Now, why does this matter to us? Um, because if there's not a pressure correction being applied in that instrument automatically, that those increased silica counts are going to flow into your trace elements um, because everything's normalised to 100%. It sums to 100%. You increase the silica content by you know 50%, you know one and a half times. You must decrease everything else. So this is where you know if you're wanting to monitor, say, arsenic concentration or something like that as a pathfinder element. Um, you might find yourself running into trouble if, if pressure correction is not being applied um, because those concentrations will decrease if you analyse the sample at you know, four and a half, five thousand metres versus down at sea level. So again, no surprises here. The physics are, are well known and pretty um, clear. So you know, jumping onto the quality of the data, um, I just want to make some comments here that we need to make sure that we are comparing the correct analytical method with portable XRF data. Um, on the left plot there, the green um, data set is a soil sample data set, portable XRF um, versus 4-acid digest. And the, that's a pretty good um, correlation, approaching one-to-one. -one. Uh, I think it's got a slope of about 1.06, so we're, we're pretty close. But then the pink population is uh, compared against Aquaregia. And you can see that that's a partial extraction. It's only getting about 10% of the rubidium that's actually in those samples, then you get a really poor um, relationship there. And if you were to only compare your portable XRF data to um, Acarigia data, you'd go, well, this is you know, not very good. What's going on? And that's going to vary by analytical method by um, and by element. So you do need to have a little bit of care there in picking that. Um, you know, you're comparing the right element with the right element. On the right-hand side there, you've got some plots of zirconium against different analytical methods. The top two panels are 4-acid digest. Um, the black line is the one-to-one -one line. Um, and we're only getting about 25% of the zirconium out of these um, soil samples that we've analysed by 4-acid digest. Compare that to flux fusion or, or laboratory um, XRF, the bottom two panels. And you know, the portable XRF is actually comparing really favourably uh, to the laboratory data. I should point out that the standards that were used to establish that correction factor, the highest zirconium concentration one was about 600 ppm. That the, um, the, the instrument is reporting uh, a little bit low compared to the laboratory. So again, you know, two examples here of just making sure that you're comparing the right lab method with the right um, with portable XRF data so that you you are actually you know comparing apples with apples and Michael you you've um, you selected zirconium and rubidium presumably because they're immobile and good to be used uh, for lithogeochemistry applications in, in identifying rock types right yeah, absolutely. You know, rubidium here, I'd be looking, yeah, rock types in, you know, felsic rocks or meta sediments. Rubidium is one of my go tos, but also, you know, um, rubidium for alteration, rubidium strontium uh, ratios are really powerful for mapping hydrothermal alterations. So, really important elements in that space. And yeah, zirconium from a lithogeochemistry point of view. And it's typically one that I see people point to as not being that good, where actually from a physics point of view, it's one of the one of the best elements to analyze by portable XRF because you get beautiful excitation off a 40 kV or 50 kV beam on zirconium. It's kind of sitting in a real nice sweet spot 
ah, you go test me now, what's the extra energy? It's about it's somewhere around 16 keV. Um, so you're getting about three times the um, excitation energy on the peak that you're trying to measure and you get optimal excitation basically. So it's a really um, beautiful element to use. And the problems are actually around the comparison data set typically. Um, yeah, not so, so many much the public data itself. Yeah, they're all doing Sorry, four acid and, and uh, they're all doing four acid and and and, uh, and atomic absorption or aquaregia and uh, yeah, it's it's not up to the job sometimes, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. And often what you find is that the four acid digest will manage to get a maybe 150 ppm of the zirconium out of the sample. Sometimes you see a hockey stick kind of shape where it will go up following the one-to-one -one line quite nicely and then it will get to about 150, 170 ppm zirconium and then just not able to extract anymore, not able to dissolve any more zircons. And that gets to be an even bigger problem in soil samples where those zircons have been kicking around on the surface for some time and any vaguely mobile zirconium has been um, you know, taken out of them there. Um, so it can be even harder in soil samples. Um, so, yeah, def and also you know, reference materials. Sometimes you struggle to find reference materials that have been analysed by flux fusion. So you can have a really nice zirconium value to actually calibrate your instrument against. So some challenges there, just things to watch out for. But, you know, um, all... All the multi-element data can be incredibly useful and, like I say, carefully corrected, you know, really powerful. And, you know, I just want to also make the point that, you know, when you, you do things carefully, here is a comparison of portable XRF data against lab data. And you can see something's gone a little bit wrong um, in the zinc plot on the left-hand side there. And, we, you know, we're looking at zinc between about 40 and 120 parts per million where that little subpopulation has, has pulled away. And what that actually was, you know, was when I went back to the laboratory concerned, um, the ICP MS had lost its calibration. And it wasn't a portable XRF issue. It wasn't a lithology issue or a matrix issue. It was actually a laboratory issue for acid digest ICP MS data. Um, so, you know, like I say, we're at pretty low concentrations there and we are you know, able to see whether the lab had um, an issue. So definitely utility and I'm just chucking this up as you know, I guess an example of how you know consistent you can be when your data are carefully um, collected and carefully corrected with good standards um, yeah and then to try and pull us together you know it's a it's a theme I'm going to try and push a little bit more at the end is I really want to see us as a community normalize you know, portable XRF data. To me, it's just another tool in the toolbox. And here are two papers that uh, I published you know, recently, 2019, 2021, Economic Geology and Ore Geology Reviews, where portable XRF data was used and there was no laboratory data set to compare them to presented. Um, portable XRF data was just used as part of, you know, as another tool in the toolbox. like using a hand lens to identify minerals or, you know, um, thin section microscopy. We just used portable XRF, we presented the data, we said we'd collected it with standards and corrected it and put it out there. And there was no challenge, you know, whatsoever from the reviewers. So I think we've kind of hit this critical point in the community where, you know, you can collect and present portable XRF data. And if you do it properly and can, you know, show people that you've collected it properly, there really is no no challenge and no um, issue anymore. So I think we've come a long way from you know, kind of 2007 when I started out, where um, you know, very much scepticism. 2000 and I guess 12 to 14, where you know the Camaro study and Gwendy Hall and the work of CSIRO as well, um, Louise Fisher and <clears throat> others were you know really working through analysing a heap of standards to you know understand where the instruments are you know, good or falling over at that time. Um, and now I think we've really reached the point of you know, no, normalised use of that. They're just another tool in the toolbox. Um, so this slide actually provides a nice segue into where I want to go to next. I want to go and explore that um, or geologies reviews um, paper uh, a little bit and present a case study of mineral exploration. Um, and if you... If the taste that I've given you here gets you really excited, there's shortly going to be released a almost 40-minute version where Todd and I have a chat about this um, 
case study in, in much more gory detail than I'm going to um, present today that will be available online shortly. So, yeah, I guess, yeah, when we're thinking about geochemical exploration or geochemical anomalies in mineral exploration, say you're looking for a gold deposit and you want to find an arsenic anomaly um, or you want to find a copper anomaly or whatever it happens to be, um, there are going to be, if you're going to go and collect a massive soil sample data set, which is what we're going to talk about here, the data set's got about 10,000 know, portable XRF analyses in it, and it's got about, and the gold in this data set is collected by Acarigia Digest. Um, so if we're thinking about what is driving the chemistry of those soil samples, there's going to be three things, I think. There's going to be the background or the, the natural elemental content of the rock from which that soil was derived. There'll be any metasomatic or hydrothermal or mineralizing process that has perturbed or changed the natural element content of that rock. And then there'll be some enrichment or depletion of those elemental concentrations you know, when the soil was formed. Um, so as, as explorers, we want to try and find number two, the, the metasomatic or, or mineralizing um, processes. Excuse me. So... That's just what I want to have a quick look at in this um, case study and kind of show you how far I think you can push portable XRF um, data. The case study is in Eritrea, so that's um, north of Ethiopia, sitting against the Red Sea in the Nubian Shield. Um, I need to thank Alpha Exploration for letting me present this case study. Um, we're in an area called Kakasha, and we've got a bunch of... Um, granites and volcanoclastics and mafic rocks and metasediments um, across this, this license area, almost a 1,000 square kilometres there. Um, and we um, have this map as mapped by geologists, um, and you can see there's that beige that kind of covers the middle of the map. 39% of the map is covered by um, cover, you know, jello soils and colluvium and you know, things like that. So we can't really see what's there. Um, we can make some inferences, but we're not, not certain. Um, th so as I mentioned before, this area is now covered by soil samples. I'll show you the map at, at the end, but it's got um, 500 by 500 regional grid and then a whole bunch of 100 by 100 uh, local infill grids. As I said, more than 10,000 samples. I think it's now probably about 15,000, 16,000 in this data set, all analyzed in the field. You know, in the field camp, you know, samples were collected, so dried, sieved, and then analysed, and the data all corrected using um, you know, the workflows that we've generated over the last you know, decade or so. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we want to try and understand what the, the, the background elemental value is of the um, any soil sample at any point. So, you know, we had that previous map. Um, that was the, as mapped by the geologists. This map here has been mapped um, using machine learning. You can read all the gory details about that um, in Sean Hood's paper that came out of his PhD, um, where we've just taken that same bedrock map, um, used the geophysics, the radiometrics, uh, the magnetics, and so on to try to um, you know, generate a better bedrock map. And if I just flick between the two of them, you'll see that actually the map patterns are very similar, but now we can um, make some classifications of the lithology that are under those cover. And we can also object, you know, be probably more objective in how things are classified. So now for any given soil sample in that whole field area, 1,028 square kilometres, we can objectively classify what the bedrock is that's associated with it. Next, so that's that point there. We've now sorted out the, the background or elemental content um, of the rock. The next thing we want to try and do is understand what the soil um, sample is, the soil type is, or regolith type is at any at any of those soil samples. You know, uh, people are not necessarily that great at always calling the same thing the same thing, especially if you have multiple teams out in a field collecting soil samples. You know, one person might call it colluvium, one person might call it alluvium, one person might call it you know, mafic derived, one person might call it felsic derived. What we have here is another machine learning. Um, product, took the um, ASTA satellite spectral data, ran it through an unsupervised clustering algorithm, and you can finish up with this map. We can then look at what we know about the local geology and derive some soil classes, like light blue, for example, is in situ felsic rocks. The green is in felsic 
uh, in situ mafic rocks, the yellows transported mafics and, and so on, and the, the blues and reds are some of that cover. Um, now we have um, a classification of soil sample, uh, soil type at any, of the, any given point. So if we have these two things, we can look at some clever statistical ways to try and derive two, that metasomatical mineralizing process. So what we can then do is take all of those soil samples and start um, playing around with that. Here we are looking for a copper gold or a gold copper, depending on where you are in the system, um, mineralizing style. So what I've done is I've normalized against the bedrock type, normalized against the soil sample type, soil type, and um, now we can make some polymetallic indices. So this here is copper from the portable XRF um, plus gold from the Acreja data at the lab. So really big data set. As I said, you know, about almost 10,000 data points when I made these maps, now 16 odd thousand, all analyzed in the field. Um, you know, some portion of those, you know, varying a little bit depending on what program we're at, go into the lab for acid digest for comparison. Um, but just the ability here to generate data quickly to enable the guys in the field to follow up without having to wait for samples to try and get back to Asmara and out of Asmara and then over to Ireland to be analysed um, was really key. And also the cost. The cost of shipping samples out of Eritrea is fairly high. So only having to send small amounts of samples and only having to send samples that we actually really knew needed to be analysed um, was, was pretty key um, here. So the multi-element data was all off portable XRF. So just huge data sets. And I think that's a massive opportunity for us as we move forward. Um, yeah, generating data sets that are potentially cost prohibitive. Um, so now I just want to jump to the mine environment. Um, you know, one of the other c quite useful advantages of portable XRF is that we can collect data directly on drill core. Um, here is an example of you know five drill holes collected over two kilometres at Plutonic Gold Mine in Western Australia. Data out of my PhD, um, data collected um, directly on the drill core, just wandering along, collecting one metre um, spaced analyses, normalising it to make sure there's no um, analytical drift in the data, and then plotting it up. Um, red is chrome, blue is titanium, yellow is zirconium. You can see some really useful trends in there in this in these mafic rocks. Um, and I've lined them all up on one of the metasedimentary marker units on that purple line with the black stars. So, you know, to go back to 10, 20 year old drill core and, you know, resample it for multi element analysis at the lab probably wasn't going to happen. You know, there's a lot of, lot of meters of drill core there. But just wandering down the drill holes with a portable XRF instrument, you know, definitely easy to do. So, here's an example of a value add that you just couldn't, you know, probably or potentially justify. Um, certainly when you're starting out, if you found it was really useful information, then you know, maybe that is the point to justify some laboratory multi-element data. But as a first pass data set, really useful. Um, so building on that data set, you know, one single fence, um, you know, we're going still back in 2011 when I was at Barracks, still a plutonic gold mine in Western Australia. Uh, here is you know, just that uh, chrome data um, plotted within the um, mine mafic um, package, the mafic rocks that I mentioned before, high chrome near the hanging wall, getting to lower chrome near the foot wall, and then those drill holes that have got the little orange bit, little red bit at the bottom, uh, that's punching back out into the foot wall ultramafic. So again, being able to generate really big data sets um, that cover large areas is really, really important. And you know, in a mine environment, you know, the samples are probably going to be analysed for gold by fire assay anyway, so you have a nice pulp sample to analyse. Um, you know, when it comes back from the lab. But and what, what was your what was your objective in these in these cases? Uh, good that, good that point. Thank you. I should comment on that one. This is about lithogeochemistry. This is about what the stratigraphy is doing. Um, what rocks join up with rock rocks? You can see on the left hand bottom left hand end there, the package gets a lot thinner. And there was always a question of you know, what kind of fold offset had happened there. It probably belongs at the top of the package and there's a, a bit of a down drop block there. Um, the other thing was here at Plutonic, it looked like there was uh, certainly in places a bit of a stratigraphic control on gold mineralization. Different uh, mineralization was being focused on the boundaries of um, different mafic units. Um, so being able to actually map out the stratigraphy and find those unit boundaries was pretty useful for um, uh, 
predicting where gold mineralization might be. Um, you know, then moving further along the um, you know mining value chain, I guess, and now we're going to look into the geometallurgy space and starting to plot up arsenic and gold data um, spatially. You know, high arsenic um, mineralization, uh, certainly high arsenic mineralization with low gold is not necessarily the stuff you want to be chucking into the um, into the mill because we knew at Plutonic where. Um, there was high arsenic, we got much poorer recoveries. So trying to forewarn, you know, doing some geometallurgical domaining um, up front to be able to improve recovery by improving the processing and, and blending and those kind of things at the plant. So here we are taking portable XRF data further down the mining mining chain. And the final example in this um, slide is um, arsenic grade shells. So gold grade, sorry, gold grade shells colored by arsenic showing that, you know, if you had lovely recovery up in the, the top, uh, the higher levels here where um, there was not that much arsenic as you kept mining downwards, you know, you're going to get into a zone that had a lot more arsenic um, in it down the bottom of the image there. So that was a bit of an early heads up that there might be some metallurgical challenges um, here. Fire, um, uh, two more examples, just briefly in the mine environment. I want to you know, get over to some chat and some and that kind of side of things. Um, so, you know, here we are at the Macrae's gold mine in um, Otago, in New Zealand. You know, portable XRF data, rubidium potassium plot, being able to break out p lights from samites fairly effectively. Here, that differentiation is quite important because the samites tend to act much more brittly than the p lights, and gold mineralization is focused in and around blocks of samite in the big um, shear zone. And we found here that the logging tended to be quite uh, sitting on the fence, shall we say. People tended to call things Samite Pelite or Pelite Samite, kind of in the mid middle, not really going to the end members of Samite and Pelite, which when you did that, you actually got a much better classification, a much better um, ability to, to model some of this stuff up. Um, so quite a simple plot, but quite a significant um, outcome. Another very brief example here with a little bit of multivariate data analysis chucked in. Uh, um, this is from a copper porphyry system in Southeast Asia. I think there's about 13,000 data points in this data set. This is just one little view of it. Uh, chuck some um, a principal components analysis with some clustering on it and then plot those clusters up spatially. And you can see that, well, I won't go into the detail, but basically clusters are hanging together. The colored data points are hanging together spatially, which means you've modeled something sensible in the um, in the lithologies or the alteration that's going on, the data points are scaled by um, gold, so you can see the high golds there sitting in the middle of the system around the pink and orange um, clusters. So something, you know, something interesting going on there. Like I say, I won't go into the details, but these are the kind of things that you can start to get at with with portable XRF um, data, multi-element data, and this here is around trying to predict, you know, what the lithologies is, what the alteration are. Um, how can we extract more value? You know, potentially some of those other things, geometallurgy, um, dropping out as well. <clears throat> um, sorry about the quality of the image on this one. It's not that great, but um, just looking at gold by portable XRF for the last two slides, here are some data from gold bars from the Olympus um, methods note that I borrowed these plots from. I have my own data that supports this, just not quite as much. Um, so this is a better example, but certainly consistent with my own experience. You, know, you point a portable XRF instrument at something that's basically just gold and silver, and it actually does a really good job of um, telling you how much gold and how much silver are there. The physics is simple. There aren't the other problem elements that I mentioned before, like zinc and tungsten and arsenic that are going to interfere. So some really nice relationships between uh, gold by Firas and gold by XRF and, and Dore or, or gold bar data here. And finally, um, some really recent data using a um, calibration that Olympus shared with um, me and, and Lauren Farmer at Reefton Goldfields here in New Zealand to play with, um, where we are analyzing gold directly in drill core, drill pulp, sorry, drill core pulp samples that have got high arsenic. So typically, a element that would basically make gold very difficult to um, analyze. You can see that there is you know, over a percent arsenic in a lot of those samples. Um, 
that's on the table on the right hand side there and getting a slope of those data coming out at you know fairly close to one and an r squared about 0.99 um so you know concentrations there are you know kind of above three four ppm starting to be able to quantify reasonably well uh, it's a really small data set still we've got a bunch more work to do here but i think it's really exciting to see these um you know as i mentioned earlier cobalt on iron interference being able to be stripped out it also looks like you know there's some good potential here in um stripping gold off the arsenic um peak which will be which will be really great um, so more work to go here, and I might let Todd comment more around this um, briefly as well. Yeah, well, I mean, to um, everyone's probably probably asking, sitting there saying, well, what 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 is the story with gold? You know, how does portable XRF do on on gold? And um, because there are so many interferences, uh, it's in a very crowded area of the spectrum. And and Michael, hold please feel free to contribute uh, your comments here. Um, it's, it's, it's always been a big challenge, you know, detecting, detecting gold accurately in a, in a, in a sulphide, particularly with, with, with arsenic, with iron, with zinc. Uh, it's always been really challenging. So in a quartz vein, different story because it's rather simple matrix. If it's well disseminated in a quartz vein, we can do quite well down to, to two grams per tonne or in a really high silica matrix. But um, what's been exciting in this recent work that we've done here, albeit in, in very high-grade you know, environments, um, was we've seen us able to strip out the influence of some of these interfering elements, particularly arsenic, and get relatively good linear relationships. So we do have a lot more work to do, but ultimately... The, the, the vast majority of our customers who by, by numbers are, the majority of our customers are gold explorers now, gold explorers and miners. Uh, the vast majority are using Pathfinder elements. You know, they're using arsenic, they're using zinc, copper, lead, antimony, bismuth and, and some other elements as their Pathfinders or they're using the immobile elements or other elements, as you showed, to identify lithology, inform stratigraphy um, and alteration in that, in that way from an exploration point of view. One, one thing we might like to make sure we mention is the ability to do gold in activated carbon. In a, in a mine environment, gold on activated carbon is one of the simplest applications of portable XRF. It's outrageously simple because we, we ha it's similar to gold in a quartz vein, only it's at 300 to 6,000 grams per tonne. Um, another advantage of that is because they have to lime wash that carbon to strip it out uh, occasionally, we can measure calcium in the pores in that carbon to, to inform when, when you need to, to remove, strip it through acid to uh, make it more porous. So um, the more and more the more and more we work with gold companies who are using instruments in their laboratories, the more we discover about how um, our instruments are, have got applications in, in the mining environment, uh, flotation samples, silica as a proxy for quartz to inform the grind time of a mill, uh, or so many different applications. Michael Hull, have you, cool. have you got, uh, you got something to add there? Yeah, not much to that. I would just say the, the, the activated carbon, gold on activated carbon, was one of the resources there on the right-hand side of the screen for those, um, if you want to download those. And all these case studies that, that Todd has just mentioned about, uh, you know, pins and bars and rolls and in, in different role of portable XRF at the mine site, is, uh, all, all those things are on, our, on the Olympus website. Very good. Well, I've got one more slide, and then I'll um, you know, try and pull it together. Um, <clears throat> you know, we, we understand the physics of you know, XRF and portable XRF, so there should be no surprises in the elements that are good, bad, or otherwise. And portable XRF data are good. They can be robust and reliable for many elements, many elements that are so useful to us you know, across the value chain in, in, in mining, you know, particularly gold. 
you know, pathfinder elements and potentially even as we move forward, you know, gold itself. We just have to make sure that they're collected, that the data sets are collected robustly and, you know, the sensible decisions around how long to analyze for sample containers or, you know, standards that are analyzed in the sample stream, all of that sort of thing. And you can do some really cool things by generating large data sets with additional elements that you might not get from the lab. I didn't mention it here, but silica, by, you don't get reported by 4-acid digest, um, but by a portable elixir if you do get silica data. So there's a really useful add-on. As I showed you before, zirconium by 4-acid digest, perhaps not so great uh, in, in you know, many situations, but portable elixir effort should be very good. And you also get rapid turnaround. You know, you're in control of that, you know, what, what samples are analyzed, when and how. You know, also, the opportunity I showed you around analyzing drill core directly to get some early insights into what's going on um, to help lithology logging and that sort of thing. And I think fundamentally, we should just, as a community, normalize the use of portable XRF. And you know, I've showed you those two papers that I published recently where it was just part of the tool, toolbox. You know, there was nothing special said about it, you know, no comments and criticism in particular from the, the reviewers. So I'm really you know, hot on that point that we just need to as a community you know drive that and i think that's you know kind of a good point for us to pick up the discussion on todd just normalizing the use of portable xrf making it part of the mainstream um workflow yeah i know um i know when we, we've spoken in the past about um uh, case studies and uh and, and you say how you, you're getting tired of seeing you know lab versus xrf Plots and, and you know we really want to be moving the narrative more to what what are you what's the next phase you know what are you doing now with your XRF that, that moves the narrative on and I think you've you've shown with the Eritrean project particularly how the comp combining large portable XRF data sets doing some statistics with that and combining that with other data sets is really powerful. Absolutely, and that certainly does bug me a bit as a someone who reviews quite a few journal papers in the portable XRF space because I get you know so many uh, because I've published so many I get so many to review that I'm probably a bit jaded by seeing as you say lab versus portable XRF comparisons going you know lead is good and copper is good and I'm like yeah we know yeah you know, we we've we've known that for a long time and all the things that you said you know earlier on um, you know were. We're, we're going to that, you know, around the Prillier example back from, you know, the early 2000s. Um, and, you know, like I say, it's all about, for me, normalization, you know, just using it, using it as a tool in the toolbox. We're there as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, yeah, uh, I do, there's that, I that. that. Sorry, go ahead, Don. No, you go, Michael. Yeah, I, I'm just going to speak to the this, this idea of sort of, uh, plowing over old ground, right? When we when these sort of XRF versus ICP kind of kind of studies, I, I wonder, Doctor Gasly, for for people who are newer to portable XRF and and the use of that, um, where would you put a good reason for some you know strategies or best practices uh, so that they're not reinventing the wheel on on best practices, but can can really sort of get a manual or a Bible of best practices for portable XRF and soil and mining studies. Yeah, certainly. I mean, look, as I've, I've said, the physics are pretty well, you know, pretty clear. And, you know, I certainly took a whole bunch of the, uh, guidance from the archaeology literature actually early on because um, they did some really good stuff, some um, Speakman and Shackley. I can't remember their first names at the moment. But, you know, that drove me in 2014 to write, you know, the, the best practice paper in the context of JORC, you know, the, the Australian um, reporting code for resources and reserves. So, you know, that's a volume that's out there. Dennis Arn wrote one at a similar time. Um, you know, there's a couple of papers by Louise Fisher around this, that time. There's a, you know, a bunch of stuff around 2014 or so where there was quite a, I guess, a watershed moment and around, the, as I've you know, said, now normalization but it's kind of taken us seven years to get there that was the um start there so yeah there's there's probably three or four papers around that time to definitely have a look at from gwendy hall louise fisher louise fisher and i and dennis Arn at that time that's where i'd start great thank you and and in the context there of of reporting data and i'll, I'll sh maybe you two can speak to this better than i can one of our 
Uh, attendees asked about using portable XRF data in ASX reporting. Neither of you speak yep. to that. I'm I'm much more comfortable, you know, with Jork. I'm a, I'm a Kiwi who worked in Australia, so I've been in you know in, in Jork land and, and reporting to, to the ASX for um, you know most of my career. Um, I'm very comfortable that so long as you are presenting the QC data that goes alongside your portable XRF data. So you know that would be some number of samples um, analysed through the lab. Um, not a problem. You know, if you want to say I collected in best practice, you know, using best practice as per you know these guys' workflow, and here are my reference materials to show that my instrument was under control, and you know so on. I I personally don't have a problem with it whatsoever, and I'd you know, refer that person to my the uh, Gazi and Fisher 2014, where Louise and I tried to lay that out as best we could. Um, if I rewrote that today, you know, seven eight years on. I wouldn't change much. So I'm pretty happy that that guidance is still yeah, very fair. I think there's possibly some more challenges in the um, NI43-101 space and the Canadian um, end of things. Uh, but no, uh, to report to the ASX, the correct elements collected correctly with good workflows, I don't have a problem with. That's definitely, but that is definitely not a carte blanche statement to just you know, grab a portable XRF instrument and report to the stock exchange. There have been some pretty, um, poor Horrific. examples Horrific. of that in the past. Before. Try and be more PC than that, Todd, but yeah, um, suboptimal. Suboptimal, that's, that's, more, that's more PC. I think um, uh, Table 1's really quite quite good and prescriptive in, in, in what it asks for if you do intend to report. And, and it's really about explaining the method that you've employed to derive the data that you're presenting. So it's, it's all about explanation. Uh, what samples have you tested? What, uh, what have been your workflows? Uh, what sample prep you might have done? Has the instrument been calibrated? So it's all about as much expert. If you are going to report GASX, and I'm no authority on this, but I've been around long enough to have seen the good, the bad, and the ugly, um, it's really about making sure your processes are robust and explaining those Clearly, uh, and yeah, absolutely, proving, and I think you know, um, yeah, just proving that your data, proving by some laboratory corresponding laboratory results that the data is solid. And I'll add to that that if you want to have the confidence that Jork was kind of expecting portable XRF data to be reported, the word portable XRF is mentioned in the guide in the table one. It's written there. Um, yeah. you know, and that's from Jork 2012. So, yeah. you know, nine, nine years ago, you know, it was kind of was expected the right word, anticipated. Um, so I, I don't think there's a problem and I think people could probably do more than they are in, with respect to reporting more portable XRF data. Yeah, we, we, we can provide um, examples of good uh, good reporting, yep. not so good reporting, if people are interested in seeing that. Uh, and I would also be cautious about adding some kind of disclaimer language, that it is portable XRF data. You know, just m make those um, statements overt, not implied. I think that would be another key to take out of that. Yeah, full transparency. Mm, exactly. Yeah, transparency yeah. on methodology, for sure. Yes. Yeah. This is a little different than uh, than gold per se, but we did a question about rare earth expl exploration using portable XRF for rare earth exploration, and in particular, the the attendee asked about uh, yttrium, dysprosium, erbium, uranium, and thorium. Um, and then, of course, there's okay, the, the early it. rare earths. And maybe <laughs> this question needs to be taken piecemeal as not all of those elements are are the Abs same, I think, for absolutely the Absolutely, it does. And actually, what, during the, we're, while we've been having this you know, webinar, one of my colleagues has messaged me almost exactly the same question. How would you use portable XRF for rare earth um, you know, exploration? And my response was um, basically I would be focusing on the elements that are telling us something about the system that the rare earths are in rather than trying to quantify the rare earths themselves because they're hard. Rare, a lot of the rare earths sit 
under major elements. Um, things like you know, calcium, iron, manganese, titanium are all interfering with some of those rare earths that you really want. You can typically get at cerium and cesium. Sometimes lanthanum can be okay. Um, but then I'd be looking at the pathfinders you know, and other associated elements, things like niobium, rubidium, potassium, barium, zirconium, those elements that we know are associated in those systems um, and, and can be good. You know, there's certainly projects where people have used yttrium and zirconium as proxies for total rare earth oxide, um, things like that. So it would be, for me, it's about, pathfind it's about pathfinder elements. I mean, it's kind of the gold problem again, right? Um, find the pathfinder yeah. elements, chase them, the ones that we know are robust. Yeah, and I'll just make a higher level comment there that, you know, if you're looking for, say, pegmatites, you're after fractionated granites. So you're after big changes in bulk chemistry. So things like rubidium potassium ratios are really good. Um, so there's certainly tools in the toolbox to unpick that. Um, but it is, it's a bit tricky. Um, and it's certainly a conversation to take offline if that you know, person wants to reach out because, yeah, it's, there's a few tricks, and, and we should also we should also declare that sometimes it won't work. Yeah, the same with some Absolutely. gold deposits where, where where there are no pathfinder elements. And and I did want to tell this story of, you know, when I was a young um, young up and coming sales guy in Australia and um, talking to an old grizzled geologist in Perth about pathfinders, and he and he said to me, Todd, the best pathfinder for gold is gold, and. and it's, it's, it's the truth, and it's a, it's a fantastic statement because, you know, there are cases where portable XRF is not, not going to work for your project. And, and let, I want us to be clear that that's, that's also our messaging here. Uh, it's not the, not the silver bullet, but the, the, there's so many applications that it's, it's definitely something you have to look at. And if I might add to that, you know, I've never... This is a bold statement, but I think I'm happy to make it. I've never had a portable XRF data set I have not got something useful out of. It might not have okay. been what I went in there looking for, but I will have. I always find something because geology is systematic. Whether I get something about lithogeochemistry when I'm looking for pathfinder elements or alteration mapping or geometallurgy, um, there is always something to be got from having a really good look through all the elements, you know, I'm pretty happy that there's probably 24 to 28 elements that in most geological settings you'll be able to get really decent data for. Um, that is a lot of elements to do a lot of really good, you know, work with. Um, and like I say, it might not quite be what you're looking for. You know, as you say, your story about, you know, the best pathfinder for gold being gold itself, couldn't agree more. Um, but you might be able to unpick your lithogeochemistry, your stratigraphy or something like that that gives you the insights as yeah. to where the gold is. Yeah. Was likely to be. I'm the same with rare earths. You know, I think the same applies to rare earths. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's, we do have a nice. Uh, key. Sorry, go ahead, Don. Yeah, no, you you go, Mike. I think you're going to say the same thing as same thing as me about. Yeah, just gonna, we do have a nice case, a nice case study on rare earth uh, exploration and where portable XRF has strengths and weaknesses. There and it, and touches on some of the literature that you referenced, Dr. Gasly, about uh, total rare earth oxides and 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 some of those pathfinder elements. So, if anyone goes to the Olympus website and types in rare earth elements, they'll 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 find that paper and it ties to some of the literature. And I think a reoccurring theme here, right, is that it's to Dr. Gasly's point earlier, it's a tool in the toolbox. It's a very powerful tool. It's not a magic wand. It's just a a very versatile tool. For solving certain types of problems. Absolutely. Couldn't on the topic of gold, we, yeah, on the topic of gold, we did have a question from our mate Aaron about um, some of the emerging technology and and uh, the portable PPB. I don't know if either of you uh, have any comments on that or had any experience with that. Um, I'm happy to make some comment to that. You know, it almost, it's it's not dissimilar to your golden carbon. Um, you know, discussion and, and case study. Basically, you know, you use elixir event to concentrate the the gold. You know, it's a gold analytical technique, low level gold. You know, PPB is in the name um, where you analyze, you concentrate the gold onto a material. 
that you can then analyze by portable XRF that doesn't have the interference issues. It's principles are the same. Um, this, the, the physics is simple. The chemistry is, um, you know, pretty well understood. So, you know, as an emerging technology, you know, absolutely. Um, it, like I say, physics and chemistry, they, they work, they're understood. Um, so, no, I have no problem with those data um, whatsoever. And I think that kind of technology has got a really key role to play in those, you know, exploration programs and in places where it's hard to get uh, samples out or takes a long time to get samples out. I think that's a really key uh, opportunity. That's where I'll be looking at it. Yeah, portableppb.com, I think it is. Uh, people might want to go and have a look. Uh, it's, it's an emerging uh, technology that's potentially extremely exciting to be able to do parts for billion gold with a portable XRF is something I would never have thought might be possible 20 years ago. Uh, but it just may well be very, very soon. Thanks, Aaron. Well, very good, gentlemen. We've we've gone a little long here, but there's been good good uh, engagement from from our attendees and good questions and good discussion here. Um, for Olympus, I want to thank you again, Dr. Gasly, for for uh, giving us some of your time here today to present on these case studies. And uh, for everyone who's uh, in attendance, the recording for this webinar will be available uh, later today. We'll follow up with an email to everyone who's registered with a link webinar again on demand. And maybe we'll try to include a couple of the resources that uh, people have asked about and include the, the links to those and, and, and maybe uh, those couple of papers that you referenced about doc best practices. Dr. Gasly will try to pull out those references for, for people who are um, newer to the practice. They can uh, learn from those that have been trailblazers ahead of, ahead of you. So thank you all. Very good. Again, and hope and thank, everyone thanks has for a, having me, I should say. I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Have a good afternoon, everyone.